Today, I'm going to talk about this is your brain on pain. Why does chronic pain happen? How does the brain influence it? You remember those old commercials like this is your brain on drugs? Well, this is your brain on pain. And there's a lot of chemical changes that happen in the brain. Specifically, we have changes in the way the brain outputs pain, sensitivity, the fire department putting out the fires versus the army creating fires, metaphorically speaking. Sometimes people get annoyed when we talk about the brain controlling pain because they feel like, oh, it's just in your head. Pain is not in your head. And even when the brain is controlling pain, it is creating real, tangible, physical, and chemical changes in your actual spine. So let's get into it. We are six videos deep in this deep dive pain neuroscience series. If you haven't watched the other videos of this series, what are you doing? Let's get the full picture. Start from the beginning and binge this series because this will completely change the way that you think about chronic pain. Story time. Here's a really cool study. They took a metal rod that was chilled to negative 20 degrees and they touched people's hands. But when they touched this very, very cold metal rod to people's hands, they either flashed a blue light or they flashed a red light. And then they asked these people, was it hot or was it cold? And then they asked them to rate the pain. How painful was it? Remember, the rod was always the same temperature. It was really, really cold. But guess what? We can't rely on raw sensations from the body. Just visually seeing a blue light made people say, oh, it was cold and that it was less painful. But when we flashed a red light, they said, no, it's hot. Wow. Oh man, that's hot. And it hurts. It's hot and it's more painful. This is the power of your brain to influence the amount of pain that you're having. And even with the exact same sensory input, just visual information completely changes your pain experience. So again, we're going to dive into how the brain controls all of this stuff. And again, metaphorically, we're going to talk about how in response to inflammation and pain and sensitivity, your brain can either send in the fire department and put out the fires or send in the military and mess stuff up and create more fires. First up, neurons that fire together wire together. This is called the Hebbian uh, learning rule. And we'll take the classic example of bending forward, creating back pain. So let's say you hurt yourself while you were bending over, maybe you were picking something up and your brain says, oh, I get the message. Bending forward is going to cause pain. So where a synapse is, we're going to have communication from the, let's just call it the bending sensor neuron, and then the neuron that goes to the brain. Now, normally to get the message from the bending sensor to the brain and say, oh, it's dangerous. You need a lot of bending. You need to bend way far forward in order to trigger a signal to the brain that says, whoa, I, that's dangerous. But your neurons like to be efficient. Your brain says, well, I recognize this pattern. There's no need for us to go all the way down. I'm just going to go ahead and preemptively hit the alarm signal so that we can just stop ourselves from even getting to the point where it's dangerous. And we'll just have pain early as an early warning system. So what your neurons do is that bending sensor and then the neurons to the brain, they're going to just shake hands metaphorically. They're going to say, all right, we're going to be buddies. Um, so now instead of having a big signal, we just need this little signal. We just need a little bit of a signal, like a, a, a wave, a head nod, a hey buddy, you know, and then all of a sudden your brain's like, okay, cool. I get the message. I've seen this before. Let's generate pain. Metaphorically, we can think about this like hiking in the beautiful Colorado mountains, the Rocky Mountains. And we, we all have these little deer trails that are, you know, barely walkable. You can barely go single file. Um, and so the more people that walk on these trails, well, they widen. We start to kill the grass a little bit. But as a consequence of the, the trails getting wider, now we get more and more people walking on these trails because now that the trails are wider, it's even easier for more people to walk on those trails. And those trails get more popular. And the more people that are attracted to the trails and walk on the trails, the trail just widens and widens and widens. But if we left it alone for a little while, and sometimes you'll see on a hiking trail that this trail is closed for restoration. Well, to some degree, the trail kind of regains some of its natural ecosystem. Well, guess what? This whole process of the trail widening, the trail shrinking, whatever, all that is neuroplasticity. It's neurons that are reaching out to each other and giving each other a handshake. And by the way, you can literally see videos of this online. I wish I would have found one where neurons literally reach out to each other. And like, it's like they're giving each other 
other a little handshake, like, hey, buddy, how you doing? And if they uh, don't associate with each other anymore, then they say, you know what? Screw you. I'm going to go my own way. It's really cool how plastic the brain is. And I shouldn't even say brain. Like when we say pain is in the brain, it's not. Pain is in all of your nerves everywhere in your body. Pain is a nervous system issue. It's many other systems as well, obviously, but the nervous system has a special role. Anyway, the brain recognizes the bending pattern uh, before you actually get to the dangerous part. So it preemptively sends an early detection or early warning system in the form of pain to let you know, hey, if you do keep going in this direction, then probably we, we think bad things are going to happen. So let's just have pain now so that you don't even go to this dangerous part. But the more you avoid bending and the more pain that you have and the more fearful you are, the more the brain is going to wire those nerves together and say, you know what, like if you hinge at all, we don't like it. Let's just avoid bending altogether. And not to mention your doctors and physical therapists are telling you not to bend, which is totally not evidence-based. Um, anyway, you end up with an early warning system where any amount of bending causes pain. So there's no danger. Your neurons are just trying to be efficient. They're trying to just help you out. But in this case, it just makes things worse. Another way that the brain influences the body is, well, that the brain literally proactively changes the body. Thoughts create physical and sensory changes. Let's take an example. Let's call this Olivia. Um, hey, Olivia. And so Olivia, every time that she goes to, you know, take a shower, do her thing, um, she also, you know, uses the toilet. Okay. Um, like probably most of us do. So her brain has started to associate going into a bathroom with using the toilet. So let's say Olivia goes into the bathroom for some other reason. She wants to, I don't know, clip her nails or something like that. Well, she goes in there not intending to urinate and she doesn't feel like she has to use the toilet. But as soon as she walks into the restroom, suddenly she gets a sensation in her bladder like, oh, I think I got to go, you know? So where'd that come from? You had the same amount of urine in the bladder prior to entering the restroom, and you did not feel like you needed to go to the toilet. But once you walked into the restroom, the context, the memory, the association triggered your brain to then prioritize sensation from the bladder, bring it front and center and say, hey, feel that? Let's take this opportunity and relieve ourselves. Or another classic example is Pavlov's dogs who are trained to salivate, right? A physical change, your parotid glands and other glands are producing saliva. That is an active muscular contraction of the gland that squirts out saliva in response to a thought, meaning a sound going into the ears. And then you're subconsciously aware of a trigger that creates a physical response in the body. Even if pain was just because of a thought, even thoughts have physical reactions. Oh, and again, thoughts are physical in their nature because thoughts are neural connections and electricity. So we need to really get over this stigma that, oh my God, my thoughts have something to do with my pain. That means I'm crazy. You're absolutely not. You're like every other human on the planet that thoughts and your mind and your body are physically connected through chemistry, through neurology. It is all one tangible physical thing. So stop the stigma, your mental health, your physical health. These are all tangible things that have real causes and real solutions. Another thing that happens in the brain is called cortical smudging, which basically, if we look at the brain, we have something called the homunculus. And that's just how the sensory and motor regions of the brain are laid out, dedicating certain pieces of real estate to represent regions of the body. And you'll notice here that we have a big, huge area, a big chunk of the brain that's all just like the tongue, the lips, you know, your eyes, that kind of stuff. Huge area of the brain dedicated to very small things in the body. Same thing with the hands. We have a huge area here that's dedicated to your fingertips and your hands. And that's because we need to really pay attention to what's happening in our hands and our fingertips. Meanwhile, you know, the entire leg to all the way from the, you know, the hip to the toes gets very little real estate because usually not a lot of very interesting things are happening on the front of the shin. You know what I mean? So your brain doesn't care as much. My point is that we have distinct regions laid out with distinct borders so that we can sense where things are 
happening in the body and use real estate in the brain to represent that. But with chronic pain, we start to move less often and we have more pain, which means that we get blurred borders. We smudge the borders. See this overlapping? We kind of don't know where, like where does the hip end and the, the low back begin? There's blurring of the borders. Where does the low back you know, end and the, the mid back begin? It kind of blurs. This is all neuroplasticity. On top of that, we get more real estate dedicated to areas that are painful. So your brain literally thinks that the area that is painful is bigger than it really is. As a result of this, we get more widespread pain and difficulty in localizing the pain. We get pain that's like, ah, it's spread out. It's a little here. And then there's like this thing over here. And I don't know, sometimes I I swear to God, I feel it up here or down here. We get this confusion of symptoms and spreading of symptoms. But even though the symptoms might be spreading, for example, down the leg, It is not sciatica. It is neuroplastic changes in the spinal cord and, in this case, the brain. And then if this happens in the motor cortex, meaning the part of your brain that controls your muscles, then we're going to have poor coordination, poor balance, and possibly weakness as well. So just like a charcoal artist, if you've ever drawn with charcoal um, or made charcoal art, you know that you have to be very careful of where your palm is on the paper, because if you're making a very detailed piece of art like this, then it's very easy to smudge the lines. And then it's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at. You kind of messed up the distinct borders of the art. But the cool thing with the brain is you can undo the smudging. Unlike the charcoal art with the brain, you can actually sharpen the image and movement is what does it. Movement of your joints. This is another reason on top of a long, long list of reasons why movement is medicine, motion is lotion, is because movement tells your brain exactly where stuff is. This is also one of the reasons why manual therapy is effective. It's not because it puts your joints into place or fixes muscle knots or releases scar tissue. It's because it's literally telling your brain where stuff is. So you have a more clear understanding of your sensations and they are not misrepresented. All right. Next up is descending pain modulation. So central sensitization is all the fires and inflammation in the spinal cord. Peripheral sensitization is is kind of the same thing more or less, but in the actual tissues in the disc, the muscle, the joints, etc. cetera. Um, and so the brain now comes into play and the brain can either send in the fire department and put the fires out, or the brain can send in the military and have collateral damage and actually create more fires. So let's talk about the fire department. But in the brainstem, we have two main areas that I want to talk about. The periaqueductal gray area, which is kind of like your 911 call center. It receives all the messages from the rest of the brain and then organizes those messages. And not the 911 center is what's going to de- decide, are they going to send the fire department or the police, or maybe they need to call in the military? Although Obviously, the 911 center doesn't really do that, but in our brain, it does. And then the 911 call center could call the fire department. Well, the fire department, we're going to call the rostral ventromedial medulla, and that's the fire station. So if we activate the fire department, the fireman is going to go to the tissue that is inflamed, and it's going to spray that inflammation with so much water. And that water, so to speak, is serotonin, it's endorphins, it's opiates, it's enkephalin. But if we want to look at this, in terms of actual anatomy, here's the spinal cord, here's a nerve root that exits to the body, um, and here's a gate where we have a danger message coming from a damaged tissue, and it has to cross this gate. But right now, the gate is on fire, it's inflamed, and everybody's just busting through the gate and going up to the brain and saying, oh my god, we're on fire. Well, if the brain calls the fire department, the fireman comes in and sprays that gate down. So it puts out the fires and makes sure that we're not getting a lot of false danger signals. In other words, it's a painkiller. So we have a lot of brain regions that are responsible for a lot of different information, and these are all communicating with your call center to tell the call center, are we in danger or not? And if the message that the call center is getting is, yes, there's danger, or no, there's not danger, or 
hey, we need to kill the the pain or put out the fire or, oh my God, we're at war, then it depends on what the call center is going to do. The anterior cingulate cortex is going to be responsible for emotions and motivations around pain. The prefrontal cortex is awareness, thoughts, and emotions around your pain. So your thoughts directly influence the message that's going to the call center. The insular cortex has some involvement in the fight or flight response. Your hippocampus will bring in memory and context. Hey, I've been here before. Was this dangerous in the past or am I safe? And that's going to bring in memory and context. Uh, The hypothalamus will bring in nervous system and hormonal or endocrine connections. And the amygdala is really primarily responsible for your fight or flight response. But at the end of the day, depending on the messages that are given to the call center or periaqueductal gray area, the call center will activate the fire station and put out the fires. But if the call center is overwhelmed with negative messages, fear, stress, alarm, 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 then it's it's going to bypass the fire station because the fire station can't fight a war. It's going to send in the military. And the fact that your brain could do one or the other, and these aren't even the only options. I'm just trying to make it simple for you. But because of that, this is why there is so much importance, in my opinion, placed on mastering your mind. Your thoughts literally become reality. This is not hippie woo-woo, uh, like it's like the secret, man. You just like send out good vibrations and stuff. No, there are physical, tangible connections from your brain to your body, from your body to your brain, and then the environment that's interacting. Anyway, your self-talk, your understanding, your beliefs, your fears, your apprehensions, all of these things, your expectations directly impact the way that the brain either physically sends out painkillers or physically makes your body literally tangibly more inflamed. And that's my next point is that the brain can literally create inflammation in your low back or anywhere. It doesn't have to be your low back, wherever you have chronic pain. So again, that's where the brain has fear, panic, stress, anxiety, etc. It's an alarm state. And as a result of this, yes, the call center, the periaqueductal gray area can have some involvement in sending out the military, but some of these areas of the brain are just going to go rogue. They're going to act on their own because your amygdala, your fear center of your brain is super important in in chronic pain. And it's just going to go straight to activating your alarm state, your autonomic nervous system, um, the hypothalamus, obviously heavily involved in autonomic reactions. So we're going to have the military sent out immediately. When that happens, when I say military, what I really mean literally is immune cells, immune cells squirt out cytokines, histamine, other inflammatory chemicals. But also we have neurogenic inflammation like substance P, CGRP, glutamate, etc. So we have a ton of chemical and neural inflammation as a result of sending out the quote unquote military or activating the alarm system. Let's recap. Today, we talked about what it looks like. What is your brain on pain? And this only barely scratched the surface. We looked at a really interesting experiment where people touched a cold metal bar, but if they saw a blue light, they said, yeah, it's cold and it's not painful. But if they saw a red light, they said, wow, it's really hot and it's really painful. So raw sensation from the body to the brain is not the whole story. Your thoughts impact how that message is received. We learned that neurons that fire together, wire together. And that the more that we groove a certain pattern, bending equals pain, bending equals pain, bending equals pain, bending equals fear, fear equals pain. Now just the fear can trigger the pain. We learned that the brain can make proactive physical and sensory changes. So it can activate the pain alarm system before it anticipates a threat just to stop you from doing the thing in the first place. We learned about cortical smudging, which is where the map of the body represented in the brain gets smudged and blurry and your brain doesn't really know where stuff is. And that leads to widespread pain, confusing symptoms and loss of, you know, coordination and balance and strength. We learned how the brain can send messages down to the spinal cord, down to the low back, down to anywhere in the body, and send out the fire department to put the fires out. And conversely, we learned that the brain can create 
physical, chemical sensitization and inflammation in the body by metaphorically sending out the army. Next time, we'll talk about the brain's involvement and really the whole body's reaction to stress. A lot of people get you know, real sensitive around the idea that stress is causing their pain because it sounds like we're saying, oh, pain's just in your head. It's oh, you're just stressed out. Stress is a physical reaction in every single system of your body. It has a real tangible cause and it has a real tangible solution. So look for the next video appearing on your screen as soon as that's published and I will see you there.